this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Hi listeners, this is Brent Sutton. Welcome to the 43rd episode of the Prax of Learning Teams podcast show. On today's show, we conclude our conversation with the hop nerd Sam Goodman. Sam delivers a powerful message about how to make safety suck less and is very much in touch with the next generation of safety practitioner. Please sit back and enjoy as we explore the ongoing journey of Sam Goodman, the hot nerd. What do you see the future as? Which part? <laughs> no, I well, I, I, I mean, For, you know, like, like everything else, um, you know, if you think about where you've come from, if you think about the last 12 months, because it's been an amazing journey, hasn't it? Over absolutely. a period of time. Absolutely. You know, for me, um, again, when all of this kind of happened with the podcast, um, when everything kind of happened again, I, I kind of accidentally wrote the, the first book. That's kind of sort of how that happened. <laughs> it started out as a blog post and turned into a book. But I, those are those are I don't know. That seems that seems like more fun to me than kind of like sitting down to plan. I'm not I'm not a, I'm not like strategic by any means. It's, most of it's just uh, just uh, writing an article and then turning it into a book. But with kind of this whirlwind of of podcast and book and kind of everything else has happened over the the past twelve months or so. Um, it's the mission's always been the same. When 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 I first started the podcast, the mission is was really simple, and it was just to make the world a better place to work. Period. Right, and and that's not changed. So when I think about what the future is, kind of where I go next, wherever that mission takes me, <laughs> to, right. to be back to embracing the chaos of yes, what so is life, organic, right? Organic. Right, where wherever that takes me, my my. My mission has always been to make the world a better place to work. Now that's kind of grown into this idea for me, kind of more pointed into making safety suck less. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's kind of the catchphrase nowadays. We're making the world a better place to work. But in particular, I really want to make safety not suck because it shouldn't suck. It doesn't have to suck, right? The ways that we do things, we, safety shouldn't be this way. It doesn't have to be this way, right? The role of the practitioner doesn't have to be this way. It shouldn't be this way. So a lot of kind of where my mind has been lately, obviously with the book and then just kind of in my day-to-day endeavors and things that I focus on is just trying to make a more impactful role for the safety practitioner. Right, and creating a safety practice that isn't just about the old, stale, starchy, stodgy things that we've kind of talked about, but trying to work our profession into the world that we, we've kind of been really afraid of going into, but risky innovation, right? We talked about safe mediocrity versus risky innovation. The change that we want to see is through innovation. It's not through doing the same things harder. Right. It's not through doubling down on the ways we've always done things. And again, I have to put in the little, you know, the, 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 the little announcement here and say, I'm not completely beating up everything that we've done throughout the history of safety. I'm not, I'm not saying that because I'll, I'll get like a thousand DMs. People saying, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> but it's the idea that we have to continually evolve. It's this idea that we have to actually do things a little bit differently sometimes. So that's where I've been kind of at. It's really been in that space and kind of circling that little rant back to the book. That's a lot of what we talk about in the manifesto. So we talk a lot about risky innovation versus safe mediocrity. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I, I mean, more and more, the type of stuff that people are talking to us about is, is how to bridge those two worlds. I recently wrote an article that's now been posted on the Safety Differently forum, and and the article was about you know our, our desire to implement you know the new view of safety and safety differently. And in the article, I said, but if we don't have a different strategy for embedding it, then are we at risk of moving to the same drift of failure? Hmm. Because what I'm seeing is that we're talking this new view. But how we want to embed it is we're still using old techniques, right? We're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to place this new view or this kind of practicing safety differently yeah. on top of the same organizational assumptions, 
Yeah. Right. We're, 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 yep. we're using different words, but we're meaning the same things we meant before. Absolutely. Right. That this is, this is great. This is great. But now let's take it. And you know, you know how we said air is normal and people may, well, that's not, no, let's try to like categorize levels of air and then we can punish certain levels of air and then it'll be super good because then we can still kind of blame people, yeah. but kind of sort of not, we can do both. And that exactly until we get into this place of understanding that doing safety differently, right? Trying to innovate in this space. It's not just a plug in and play program. It starts with a true shift in our beliefs. Right. It starts and organizationally, right? Our collectively held beliefs as an organization. That's why that's why the one of the first books that I encourage folks to read when they reach out to me about anything human organizational performance is Todd's five principles book. Right? Because at least, at least with those five principles, if you can't look at that list and go, check, 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 we really believe this stuff, you're not really going to go anywhere. You're not going to get that. You're not going to get the um, with, with term. You're not going to get the sustainable um, value from it. Right. I'm, I'm. I'm a firm believer that there's not much. There's not much in our worlds. And I'll just. I'll, 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 let me. Let me stick to safety and not venture too often to philosophy here. But <laughs> there's. There's not much in it that that we can place into our organizations that's an inherently good or evil. Right. We can take something and when we immerse it into our organizations, right, our underlying beliefs ultimately influence which direction it goes. Right? That's why you see organizations that have really, really, really strong, and I'll, I'll just use a blanket term culture, have a really, really strong culture that you can drop something in there that's, that's almost a shit bomb and folks will figure out a way to make it useful for them. Right? Or you can take something that's as powerful, as powerful as human organizational performance, something as powerful as learning teams, and unless there's a shift in those underlying assumptions, you drop it in that organization and what happens? It just explodes right? and not in a good way. Right? Right. They, yeah, yeah, the yeah. organization just finds a way to make it horrible. Right? Yeah. Well, for, and for me, it, all, all that change always comes back to those assumptions. If the assumptions, if, if our, the assumptions that we begin with are flawed, we're yeah. never going to get where we want to go. And look, more of our narrative now is all focusing around what does a learning organization look like? Yeah. So we're well, I, away from this thing about, you know, what does a safe, different organization look like? We're saying learning is learning. Yeah. 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 And, and it's not actually that hard to learn because it's a natural instinct. Uh, what we need to do, like all types of learning, is we need to find the opportunities to learn. And... Yeah. Just recently, we've even changed the language that, that when we talk about event-based learning teams, that's severity-based learning. Hmm. I, yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. convinced um, how much learning can occur at a worker level when you're dealing with severity. Right. Um, organization learning happens regardless, but worker learning gets, gets, I think, gets reduced purely because of the emotional element of around the event. Mm. Whereas if we think about, say, uh, what we call management of change or periodic learning teams, um, they're, they're based on macro learning. That, that, that's where you're seeing an accumulation of change over time and you're seeing that misalignment. But the true learning happens at the coalface. And that's what we talk about. That's that micro learning or that everyday learning. And, and workers are learning regardless. The thing that concerns me is that most le uh, learning that happens at the moment at the coalface is incidental learning it's not deliberate it happens right. by accident yeah except yeah, yeah. they, they yeah, come across a different situation that they're used to they come across a you know different variability and they learn from that but that learning is not intentional mm. and and that's my concern we we need to make learning needs to be a deliberate action absolutely we, yeah. we need to provide a mechanism and a framework not a process it's a it's a framework to allow that <laughs> right. to occur. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I, I think we have to be cautious, right? Because I think as organizations, we were we were picking on psychological safety being used as a buzzword, but learning finds its way into our corporate vocabulary in the same fashion, right? Organizations are very quick to say we're forward we're forward thinking and learning well, organization. 
Yeah. Right. Exactly. So I think to exactly what you said, having that framework, better defining what that actually is, adds value. Right. It's it's important to define what that actually looks like. And I think that the word that you used is is very important. It's, it's the word that I was getting ready to say before you took it right out of my mouth. It's deliberate. Right. Learning has to be deliberate, and we have to create environments in which honesty is possible. We have to create environments in which learning is possible, right? If we continue to go down kind of this old school path of just, and again, I'm picking on blame and shame just because it's a really easy example. But as as Todd says much better than I could ever string together, that blame moves in the opposite direction of learning, right? So if we're staying in this kind of notion or this idea of kind of old school stick and carrot management of safety. I don't know if an organization can really say that we're a forward thinking and learning organization. Yeah. Well, look, I had this recent experience where we're running a learning team and one of the managers said, look, you know, great, I love the learning team, but I was really disappointed that not everyone was contributing. I said, well, look, I said, that's really fascinating because the, the, the fact is you need to think about it in a different way. You need to think about it when people are getting involved in something, particularly something that is different or new to what they're used to, then there are gonna be some of those that are just there to participate. There'll be some of those that actually want to contribute and there'll be some of those that actually want to challenge. Mm. Now, the fact is everyone starts at a different point and is on a different journey. What will change is that what you see over time is that those people would progress and that's normal but don't expect 100 percent of all your people to be at this high level because that's just the false economy because right. everyone is driven by their own background their beliefs their cultures well it, as you said you, you, you're dealing with the most unique of all you're dealing with individual people yeah <laughs> right so this idea that and it's some of that's even perception, right? So that manager as an example, they're viewing that learning team and seeing those folks that they're just kind of labeling, it's just labeling. They're labeling them as non-contributors only because they're not contributing in the way that they believe that they should be contributing, yeah. right? So I see this a lot, and I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen this a lot with learning teams, where you have that person that's completely silent in, in a learning team. That just kind of sits there. They're the person that, as a facilitator, you got to kind of like, you got to kind of like coax them a little bit to get some words out of them. But that same person will then circle back to you <laughs> a little bit later and just say, "Hey, look, I wasn't. I'm just not. I don't know. I'm just not. I don't like talking in front of people. But yeah. I'll gladly talk to you about this." Or they'll pass stuff through their friend that will then <laughs> send that over. Or they'll be sitting there text texting their friend that's the loudmouth across the table to ask a question. <laughs> that they're not comfortable asking, right? So that person can ask it. So it, it is that, right? That most times, and I agree with you that, especially when learning teams are kind of new for the organization, folks kind of start, there, there's some apprehension there, right? They kind of start and they kind of approach the table a little kind of uh, not so sure, especially if the organization has a not so great track record with stuff like this. Right. And they're not sure they're going to test the waters. They're going to see. And then most of those folks will then kind of mature into kind of the loud mouth that we would love to see. Right. But again, some of those folks just they just don't communicate the way that we all communicate or maybe that group communicates. Right. So for me, it's always been this idea that we have to meet people kind of in the middle. We have to meet them a little bit on their terms as well and how they like to communicate, how they're comfortable communicating. So that might be, you know, leaving that kind of a little bit open-ended and saying, if you come up with anything else, you know how to find me, right? Here's my number. Text me. If you don't want to call me, text me, you know, send me an email. God, I don't know. Leave me a slide of note under my door. Right? And, and when we talk about progression, um, Sam, we're also saying that it's not a question of going in one direction. It can be going back. Yeah. I mean, people can <laughs> yeah. fall in and out, but what you're wanting that you're wanting to see that, that, that is actually happening. So, so we, we, we did an experiment recently where um, uh, we like to capture not only what the organization gained from the learning team, but also what workers gained and what the facilitator gained. And we didn't want to go around and ask each worker, what did you gain from this? Because that puts them on the spot. Right. <laughs> so what we did, we put them into little groups of three. And we got them to basically say, if there was one key learning that, that you came, that you got from this, what would that be? And they're really happy to do that as a little tiny group. 
and then to present that back. And what was amazing is that there was such a wide variation of learning. It wasn't all the same thing. Whereas if I had gone round and said, what did you learn? By the time I get to certain people, they'll say, well, everyone else has already said it. Which is just that person's version of saying, I'm not comfortable in sharing that. So I I think you have something interesting there too, around this notion that kind of back to learning is learning, right? That's, that's a, a, a part that the organizations that I've kind of been around seem to struggle with at first, right? Is the idea that we set out with this very precise strategic problem statement of what we want to fix. The organization already has in their mind what they're trying to learn about and the, all, the most of them already have the fix for it in their head, right? They just want confirmation that we can then move forward. But when you come out of these learning teams, as you said, kind of kind of back to that variability between what folks kind of pick up and what's important to them, because it probably does come back to a matter of what's most important to that that individual. Absolutely. Right? The piece, the piece that they pull out of that. But it's still learning is learning, right? You might start off trying to solve ABC, but when you're done, we've we've discovered a whole new set of something over here in XYZ land that we just fixed. Now we we might still have problems with ABC, but we still learned something, right? We still learn something and that's a huge that was a huge takeaway for me right because it's easy to kind of get into that box of going okay we have this this very rigid problem that we need to solve yes yeah. and again I'm, I'm not dissuading this idea of staying on point and staying on target right because a, a, a good facilitator obviously does have to have to have some ability to kind of herd the cats if you will mm-hmm. <laughs> right? yeah. especially when you get right. a, a a group full of a group full of angry crafts people not angry but you know what i mean a group a group full of grass people together, right? Uh, or just humans, humans in general in a room, it's easy for us to kind of drift off. I know I uh, obviously listen to our conversations, right? I'll drift off into outer space, right? At least Brent here has a good way of like pulling me back into reality and kind of keep keep pushing me. Into, it's uh, it's, exactly, it's just into some form of direction. I, I read right? my but, book, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. But this idea that, you know, even if we don't solve whatever prompted us to do this, this learning team, or prompted us to learn in general, even if we don't necessarily solve that problem to our liking today, we still learn something, which is still super powerful. Learning happens. And just recently, I I, I had, I was uh, two different organizations, and they were saying to me, look, we've heard of these learning teams, but they take days. And I'm saying, um, that ain't a learning team. Yeah, that's, yeah, someone is someone is doing something wrong. Here. Someone <laughs> has weaponized it and given it a name. Yeah, so I I I did a very similar situation in an organization that I was chatting with, and it, it, it's it's almost to a T, right? Where they're talking about these learning teams, they just we, they're they're just so cumbersome that that they're not worthwhile for us. And I'm going, wait, what, what do you like cumbersome and learning team? That doesn't that doesn't work in my mind. It's kind of the opposite, right? It's streamlining learning. It's making it easier. So what's going on? They're going well. Yeah, we had a learning team on this this event that shall remain nameless, um, and it went on for thirty days. Oh, and I'm going wait 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 what, what what pause? Let's press pause here a second. I want you to erase everything that you know about learning teams and let's 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 start over. Right. I've actually got a really good book by a gentleman and a group of authors that you should probably read that I can point you in the direction of. Right. That's scary. But once again, we, we always knew that this weaponization was going to come along. We always mm. knew it because history has told us that, um, Sam, time and time again. Right. And, and that's why you know, when Todd came out with those five principles, which I think was an amazing, an amazing book, that was that was his way of trying to manage weaponization. Yeah. And we did the same thing. We basically said, right, it's really important that we create these core principles around learning team. And people need to go back and reflect, did the learning team, did it deliver those core principles, those core philosophies? Right, right. And if it's not, it's not a learning team. I I completely agree. And and I I think that's where a lot of the value around those principles, where, where, where it's extremely valuable. Yeah. Right. And the idea that you have a lens to view whatever through. Right. So as organizations, I'll, I'll, I'll use some of, you know, Todd's five principle book. You know, I, I share that with folks all the time and saying, well, you know, if it jives with these five principles, you're in pretty good territory. Right. You can you can just it's a safe bet. We'll just say it's a safe bet. 
no matter what you're trying to accomplish in your organization, when you start down the process of wanting to do X, Y, Z, program this and that in this space, how's it line up with those principles? It's just a good starting point. It's a good lens, right? Just back, back to using the lens. It's a good lens to view the things that we want to do in our organizations, right? And, and if it doesn't, you probably are going to run into some issues. <laughs> Right. Well, you're, probably, you're probably going to have some trouble. Someone the other day was touting how to simplify learning teams. And I'm just saying, oh, my God. Right. Oh, my God. Well, you know, we, you know, you see it. Um, I know I, I, I've been kind of on a rant about kind of the blame and shame stuff today. But you see that around Just Culture, mm -hmm. right? What a powerful book Just Culture is, mm -hmm. right? And if, for folks out there, if you haven't read it, you, you're living under a rock. You need to read Just Culture. It's probably my favorite Decker book, it's Just Culture. Yeah. But you, you now see a whole slew of consultants out there that are selling Just Culture, how to do Just Culture and still beat people check sheets, yeah. right? That's, that's exactly that. It's the weaponization of something that should not be weaponized at all. <laughs> It's this idea of saying that kind of, and I kind of hit on it just a little bit ago of saying, well, if this is a deliberate act and this isn't an intentional act, and this is just a common mistake and, and, and this, this is performed with malice, well, what are we doing? Are we going to, we're going to do like first degree safety infraction, second degree safety infraction. Then are we going to do safety degree, felonious safety degree, safety infraction? Yeah, yeah, are, we, are we going to paint the same picture that we paint in, in law, right? And then we're going to do, 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 we're going to add varying weights of punishment to each of those levels. And to an organization, it's super clean, right? It's clean and it sounds, and that's the problem, kind of back to a lot of what we chatted about at the beginning. We're talking about how we end up in a lot of this space. Ease is definitely a factor, but on the surface of a lot of this stuff, it sounds, it appears, morally sound oh, look at, but, it, when, it we, I, I but mean, when we dig a little bit deeper we start to go oh wait a second <laughs> right yeah. I mean we, you, we see the same thing around zero zero is a great example right where it's 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 morally sound to say that I don't want anyone to get injured on our sites I don't want anyone to get hurt or killed at work but now when we say that as I'll just call us normal people when normal people say that, in our heads, we think absolutely right. I don't want someone to get maimed or killed, right. be just just out trying to earn a living for their family, trying to trying to that's make right. a living for themselves. But that's not what the organization means. Yeah. What we mean is we need absolute zero bumps, scrapes, unacceptable. Every company has some form of zero slogan, target zero, mission oh. zero, this zero, that zero, absolute zero, better than zero, you know, this or that or the other, you know zero to the point to where we're going to start resurrecting the dead you know it's going to be better than wow. zero right we're going to we've got all this kind of stuff yeah. and and ultimately what we're doing is un rather than understanding that's that safety is a dynamic thing that is created in the field we're still clinging to safety as an outcome right we're just we're just chalking it up to an outcome and that's where there's so much so much value and as you said you you hit on the definition of redefining what safety is to our organizations as long as we're staying and this even kind of ties back into making the safety profession suck a little bit less as long as we're saying that our ultimate value of the the, as the organization is zero what we're really saying is that safety is an outcome to be managed mm -hmm. and the role of safety practitioner their job is to work to support the values of the organization, right? So the value that they're going to support is managing that outcome, right? So, so here's uh, the interesting thing. If we do achieve zero safety, if we do achieve it, let, 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 let's, let's, let's say, well, let's now, you know, take some magic mushrooms and say we've achieved um, right. um, zero. I, I'm, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for my mushrooms, Brett. You didn't okay. ship them to me. I can't, um, we're both going to get raided by the DEA now. Correct. <laughs> or, or whatever your equivalent is. <laughs> <laughs> When, so if if we, if we get rid of harm, okay, where where does learning then happen? <laughs> right, right. That's the paradox. Yeah. Because at the moment we're only learning through misery. Yeah. Well, so in so so much of what's missed, right, is is we get so focused on the pain point, as you said, right? Organizations have, have a pain point, and that pain point is that we hurt employees that we maim and kill people with frequency in our industries and within our organizations, right? We have that pain point. The problem is, is that we want a simple, easy fix for that problem. We think that the way to fix complexity is through simplification. 
we, we, we try to simplify our way towards safety success. If we just say zero, we finally get zero, then by God, we're at zero. But even kind of adding on to your point a little bit is that even if we do get to zero, of course, we can always throw out the duh question, which is, is that zero real? Because it's probably not, right? I, I could just about, I would just about put my bottom dollar on it that your zero is fake, right? That your employees are just telling you what you want to hear. But then also with that, just because we have zero harm does not equate to zero risk. Right? Oh, that's right. We, we, zero <laughs> mistakes. Right. Uh, right. Errors. Right, right, right. We're, sure. we're just looking at the at the absence of something now. Yeah. And kind of in line with that, this idea that we're only learning from misery seems like a really stupid thing to be doing, right? And I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn from those events because obviously, kind of, duh, we should. But just from a data set standpoint, we have so much more data on the positive side that we should be examining, right? And I think that's where most organization probably missed the boat more than anything else is we're looking at this little tiny, tiny handful of events that most of us have, right? Because we, we've gotten rid of most of the meat grinders out there. We've gotten rid of the stuff that lobs off arms and hands at least regularly, right? And so the ones that we're looking at are usually pretty catastrophic events or it's either one or the other, right? It's a bump or it's a fatality. <laughs> it's yes. a knee scrape. Or, or it's or it's a lost arm. There's not there's not much in between on that scale anymore. I, I I'm 100 with you. I, I got a group recently to turn Heinrich's pyramid around. Mm. Okay, and said that if you if you think about what Heinrich was trying to say about his ratios, and, and I won't talk about what those ratios are, but if if you try and say for it, he was basically saying that if you're looking for a, like a major event, that's got low frequency and low similarity. If you're looking at minor events, now you've got a slight increase in frequency and a slight increase in similarity. Right. But if you look at everyday work, you have a huge frequency and a huge similarity. Right. So, but if, if we put all this resource and effort into event-based learning, and it takes people hours and days to do that. Then they're saying, so we're now moving from one thing to you wanting me to look at 10,000 things or 100,000 things. Right. And people are saying, I can't, I can't use the same amount of time to do that. Right. And that right. becomes the issue, that they're looking at it, they're in this linear frame, and they think that the effort they put into one thing is the same effort they've got to put into something else. And that becomes scary for them. Right, right. And no one is giving them an alternative. So stick. So we we stay to our bubble because that's where we can show gains through corrective actions mm. rather than showing gains through presence of capacity. Right. Um, right. And right. and if the objective of things like one percent safer is to basically say that we should improve safety one bite at a time because um, it's all about continuous improvement. Does it make sense? It's all about right. you know doing things on a daily basis. Then I'm 100% in for it. For sure, yeah. 100% into it because yeah. safety is not fixable in one big bang. Right. It can, uh, and I don't think safety is fixable. It's only improvable. Right, right. Well, and it's, it's some of some of it is this acceptance because, and I, I don't want to come across as like doom and gloom, Sam, or anything here, but it's this understanding that anything that we do in life, whether it's at work, we, we like to pretend that work is a special world where the stuff that exists outside a normal world doesn't exist, right? That if we just do this stuff, like if we just reach to kind of pick pick back on the safety and sanity piece a little bit that if we just finally get all of these things maxed out if we get all these levers mixed maxed out to where people are max awareness max caring maximum rule following maximum all this stuff then we're finally going to reach this safety utopian state where there's zero there's zero harm there's never bad outcome uh, there's never another bad outcome again but unfortunately that's just not how life works period well it, it can't it can't work because the hazard, the thing that harms us, the hazard. If the hazard is present, risk must be present. Right. So so the fact is, at the end of the day, whilst hazards exist, risk has to exist. Right. 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 Exactly. 
exactly yeah. and it, it's 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 this idea though that that we that if we finally just get all that stuff maxed out we reach utopia mm -hmm. all is well we just solved safety everything's every, everything's hunky dory everything's fine but kind of as as we're kind of going down this path we have to accept that that's never going to be the case the stuff that we do is inherently dangerous stuff mm -hmm. and it probably always will be if you walk into a power plant and you look at the stuff that people make happen it's things that should have never occurred on our planet <laughs> it's things that but for our ingenuity and willpower as humans we created it right anytime they got all... the energy <laughs> <laughs> right. You look at that and you go, well, yeah, for sure. We'll just make this to where it's just never going to have any risk. Not going to happen. Right. Absolutely not going to happen. Our world is too complex. It's too chaotic. It's too messy for us to ever get to that point. Right. So it's this idea that I totally agree with you. I don't think it's something that's solvable either. I, I think we have to, but first kind of going down that path is acknowledging that the world is a big, mean, scary place mm -hmm. and understanding that we're never going to make it not a big, mean, scary place, right? The old saying, the razor is always going to be sharp. You're never going to make the razor not sharp, right? It's, it's always going to be sharp, right? The power plant's always going to be dangerous, right? The factory is always going to be dangerous. Now, for sure, we can make it a whole lot less dangerous, yeah. but that's always going to be there, oh, right? Or, or more, <laughs> or more yeah. dangerous but not not, not but it can never be not dangerous right right there's there's everything that we do in our life if i walk outside on a bright sunny day in arizona there's still a good chance i get struck by lightning yeah. right? it, and, it and that's can still this, happen and it does so that's this notion that risk ebbs and flows right so if, if we think about it um the our mitigations our barriers our, our controls whether they are trying to manage the hazard or influence the person those barriers controls and mitigations have to ebb and flow right their, their ability to do that is going to change it's not constant it's not constant. Right. does that make sense i mean absolutely absolutely everything breaks down right and that's a point that we we so often forget right and it's this idea kind of kind of kind of back into a little bit of safe mediocrity we believe that there's safety and stasis, right? That if we can just get to the line, hold the line, kind of back to that utopian ideal state, that all will be well. But we forget one really important underlying, <laughs> underlying piece here is that our systems are in a constant state of degradation. Yeah. Right? We, we, we forget that. We think that there's, there's better, worse, and the middle. And that our goal is to just get good enough to where we can ride the middle. But the middle doesn't really exist. Right, we're either getting better or we're getting worse. Correct. Right. And of course, does Sam, the, the, the middle does exist, but we can draw some pretty, pretty broad assumptions about it and say that the middle is probably where innovation goes to die, right? If we're right in the middle. And B, right, it's it's kind of sort of doesn't because we're constantly degrading. So even kind of tying that back into this point of understanding that, you know, kind of redefining safety, even if we just say that safety is the presence of something. And let's just say in this case we say defenses. Right. That still drives us back towards learning because learning is the only tool that we have to understand weak, missing, flawed or degraded defenses. Hello. Right. And back back to stuff that actually actually stops people from dying at work. Robust defenses. Right? Yes. So, so and, we, we, we started using this a new big word the other week, Sam, called um, um, uh, um, efficacy of mitigating yeah. defenses and yeah. controls. So use a learning yeah. team to look at the efficacy of something. In other words, I like it, which is a very flash word for saying, does the shit align? Right. I like it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I can use that big word and, and we get to charge more for a big word. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and, it, and it sort of reminds me because the same client that we're talking to was basically talking about saying, oh, can we replace um, our HAZOPs, HAZOPs operability studies with learning teams? And I'm saying, no, what? A, a learning team simply gives more context to a HAZOP yeah. because yes. the HAZOP is focused around, um, you know, the design of the machine, its redundancies, all those things. That's the engineering part. Right. Really good. Learning team doesn't do that well. 
No. That, that, that's what a HAZOP does really well. But what a learning team will do, it'll help you to see how people have to interface and relate to and deal with those systems. Right. Well, and I, I think it's you- uh, two uh, things. I, I really appreciate the fact you, you bring up context just in particular, not, 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 to, not to veer this too far off from that conversation. But in our world, especially in safety, right? It seems like we, we purposely try to remove context rather than trying to understand it, right? It's so much easier for us to sit back and try to paint this black and white picture back to that kind of world that we want, right? We try to create this utopian state where context doesn't matter, rules, you just follow them, everything's fine, and we, we just get to where we wanna go that way. So anything, anything that helps us to explore context is always gonna be immensely valuable for us within our organizations. This idea that context is important, that it matters, and it matters a lot. Safety has been one of the only real pursuits, if you kind of look back at it, if we, if we try to approach safety more as a science, right? Oh. We have to admit context. We have to understand that this particular situation at this plant, at this moment in time, is not the same as the exact situation a day from tomorrow at a different plant. It's, it's just not the same. There can be some similarities for sure, but understanding the context and examining the context is always going to be vital to us. And it's for so long, again, I, I don't know. I, th I think it's just this idea that we try to try to create the world how we, how we wish it were rather than how it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just displaying this on your screen to you at the moment, Sam. Mm -hmm. This is from ISO 31000, you know, the risk management standard. Yeah. It's the very yeah. first thing it asks about, it says scope, context, and criteria. Yeah. yeah. And it says that if you don't get the context right, then everything else creates weak points and weak signals. Right, right. And it's like, you know, I say to people, hello. You know? Well, because people, yeah. people think that standards are bad. And I'm saying, well, I've got, I got to tell with you, these these standards have come from lifetime works of things. Right, right. What, and to, and, and I agree with you, standards are not, uh, you know, some, they're, they're not inherently evil, I'll say that. <laughs> having, 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 having a collective, having a collective kind of body of understanding is probably a really, really good thing that we've kind of put into something, right? That we can then share and kind of understand that this is a pretty good, pretty good thing. Right? Hey Sam, <laughs> absolute pleasure, mate. I really appreciate your time and your dedication. Um, you know, like everything else, um, we're all trying to pursue and, and to make things um, improve things over time. So, so keep up the good work. I'm super excited about your new book. I'll definitely be connecting in on it. Um, and um, let's keep the dialogue open. No, absolutely. I look forward to having uh, you and hopefully at some point in the future, your whole gaggle of co-authors on on the show at some point. Talk a lot oh, no, we're, 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 we're dead keen. I mean, you know, you, you just find us a time and, and, and we'll love it because- um, so like it's. It's easier on my end. I'm one, so you are many. <laughs> no, no, once again, all those things can be managed. Um, and they, and it's really interesting. Uh, things are different when we're together as a group. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and despite despite what you believe, um, Glynis is the one that comes out with the most amazing one-liners. I, I, I'm yeah. the straight one. Yeah, yeah. I'm the straight one. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. We're, we, we're going to make it happen. As soon as I get off of this, I'm going to start pestering you about dates. So there you go. Perfect. Well, you, you, you've got the <laughs> link I've sent you, so use that link. All right, Sam. Absolutely. Care, we'll make it happen. All right, All right talk to you soon. Thank you, listeners, for being part of this podcast. We would love to hear your learnings or other topics you would like us to explore about learning teams. Go to www.podcastlearnings.com and give us your feedback. Become part of the community of practice with learning teams. Go to www.learningteamscommunity.com. Support the authors of the practice of learning teams. Purchase the book from Amazon.com or go to www.learningteamsbook.com for an inside look and other free book resources from the authors.
The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.